I'd like to call to order the regular meeting for November 16th, 2020. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation. God, our creator and provider, we thank you for this time to serve the city of Goodyear in this time of great trials. We pray for all those who must go to the workplaces to keep our city safe, our people fed, and our children educated. Bless their lives and the lives of the families. Renew their strength. Be by their side as they do their work. Give them generous hearts to help every person with kindness. Help us tonight, too, to make wise decisions in this unprecedented, difficult time. In your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone is present. Please, um, city clerk, go ahead and read your piece. Thank you. While the Goodyear City Council meetings are open to the public, the occupancy has been reduced to implement social distancing. Seating is generally available on a first-come basis, but meeting attendees will be cycled in and out if necessary to allow for speakers to speak on certain agenda items. If you wish to speak during a regular meeting, please complete a speaker's card so that we may ensure you are in the room for that item. Face masks are required and must be worn when moving throughout the building. Our residents still have several ways to address the council. They may submit their questions and comments to public comments at GoodyearAZ.gov. And during meetings, they can view the meeting using Facebook, YouTube, and the link from our agendas using Granicus. After the meetings are completed, they can also be viewed on YouTube. The public may always contact the mayor and council at any time by sending an email to GYCouncil at GoodyearAZ.gov. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? And will city clerk please read consent agenda item one through four by title only, please. Number one, approval of minutes. Number two, approve fiscal year 2021 transfers. Number three, approve site 13 and 23 TTHM mitigation expenditure authority and related budget transfer. Number four, approve a 90 day extension of the approval of the final plat of Hudson Commons parcel two, phase two, subject to stipulations. Thank you. Does anyone in the council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? All right, then. Can I have a motion and a second to approve items one through four? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Stiff and a second from Councilman Pazillo. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Councilmember Pazillo? Aye. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Councilmember Hampton? Aye. Councilmember Kano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, there are two public hearings on the agenda. The first public hearing item is to consider a rezone of property on the northwest corner of Cerville and Van Buren uh, to MF-24 with Cascade Falls at Canyon Trails Overlay. As soon as I find them, okay. <laughs> Open public uh, meeting. Uh, Planner Christian Williams presenting. Good evening, Mayor Lord and City Council. I'm here before you this evening with a request from Daryl Schmidt to conduct a rezoning on a property within the city. The property is approximately 12.2 acres and it is located at the northwest corner of Cerebral Avenue and Van Buren Street. The Melanie is... Martino with Richmond American Homes is now exiting. All right. The property is currently zoned PAD under the Canyon Trails Phase 1 PAD, and it has an underlying zoning of C2 General Commercial. So it's that star right here. As it relates to the general plan land use, the project falls in the neighborhoods area. This is a similar category to the apartment complex developed adjacent to it called in Cantata at Canyon Trails. The project is also within the transit-oriented development overlay. For a little history on the property, the project, or the property zoning, the project was initially zoned as part of the Canyon Trails Phase 1 planned area development with an underlying zoning of C2 General Commercial back in 1999. Since that time, Arizona State Route 303 Loop Freeway has been constructed to the west, as well as the Cerebral Avenue 
ramps at Interstate 10 Papago Freeway. I will point out a few things from the regional context about this site. There are business and commerce general plan land use locations at Citrus Road um, and at Cotton Lane along both sides of Interstate 10. So that is right here. There is also business and commerce land use designations on both sides of the freeway at Estrella Parkway, both, both north and south. So Pebble Creek Parkway, Estrella Parkway. The nearest C2 zoned commercial centers in the area are at Estrella Parkway and Van Buren Street. That would be the Canyon Trails Plaza, which is anchored by Safeway. That's a mile east. There's Cerebral Avenue in Yuma, which is the Cerebral Marketplace. That's anchored by Fries, or as I like to call it, Fancy Fries. And that's about a mile south. There's the Canyon Trails Town Center at Cotton Lane and Future 303 at Yuma Road that's anchored by Target. And that is about a mile and a, a mile southwest as the crow flies. So those are your other commercial opportunities in the area. As it relates to other multifamily in the area of Goodyear, between Thomas on the north, Yuma on the south, Citrus on the west, and Litchfield on the east, there are eight established multifamily communities, and those are shown in green. There are seven under development or recently completed multifamily projects, and those are shown in purple. There are 11 zoned for multifamily, and those are shown in yellow. And there are four projects in the pre-application or review process, and those are shown in that gray or um, bluish color. For context, the site we are discussing tonight is this red square here at Cerebral and Van Buren Street, Cascade Canyon Trails, Cascade Falls of Canyon Trails. Zooming in a little bit closer, you can see that the project is south of Elk Grove at Canyon Trails. That's a single family residential. North of Raven Heights at Canyon Trails, also single family. West of the Harvest Baptist Church land and some vacant agricultural lands along Cerebral, and I affectionately call that area the Highway to Heaven, and immediately adjacent to Encantada Canyon Trails, which is a multifamily project to its west. The basis for the zoning is the city's MF24, multifamily 24, which typically permits 24 units per acre. I will highlight some major changes that are proposed within this PAD overlay. The use of the PAD overlay is justified as the current development standards for the MF24 zoning district are in need of updating. Only three older apartment complexes, all near Central Avenue and Van Buren Street, have a multifamily designation established outside of a PAD or a PAD overlay process. The current rear setback is listed as 20%, which is not practical given the modern apartment complex design. In order to allow this development to move forward, thus a PAD overlay was utilized. The zoning ordinance requires a trash enclosure be located either 50 feet from single family zoning districts or 30 feet if a landscape buffer is created. The manner in which the single family residential to the north here was developed, there is a large landscape buffer and a wall on the single family side of the development. The setback was reduced to 25 feet from the property line because the trash enclosure will be located 150 feet away from the lots with single family residential. So that is stipulated in the zoning. Here's your houses, trash will be 150 feet away. And depending on the wall height and based on current standards for our carports, a carport could be as close as six feet to a wall. The applicant will be setting back all carports at least 15 feet from any property line on that side. The applicant requested a reduction of five feet on the west side for the setback, which is adjacent to another multifamily project. Under the current C2 general commercial zoning, the side setback would be currently zero. Although this is a reduction in the multifamily setback, the impact to the existing multifamily development would be minimal. And under our current multifamily zoning, a landscape buffer would not be required on the north side of the property. However, to reduce the impact on the single family, the landscape buffer required in the existing C2 commercial zoning is going to be carried over into this MF24 with PAD overlay to ensure that the current landscape buffers will remain the same if this project is to move forward. Design standards shall be in conformance with our chapter three of our design guidelines, except as follows. Residential buildings may have exterior downspouts when they are used in a matching design element. Carport roofs may be sloped with, um, and designed to complement the residential structures. The site wall style, if they choose to construct one, will match the existing one found in the Canyon Trails area. And the multifamily project will bear the name of the master planned area, Canyon Trails. So it'll be multifamily project or Cascade Falls of Canyon Trails. 
Color schemes will also add interest and variation to the buildings on the site. At least two base colors and three accent color materials shall be used throughout the site. The combination of the base colors and accent color materials shall be used in a manner which creates a minimum of four unique building schemes throughout the site and a variation of roof height is encouraged. This will help ensure that the site does not have that cookie cutter, all the buildings look exactly the same appearance or that tunnel vision effect as you drive down Cerebral Avenue with all the buildings looking the same. And with that, staff has evaluated the impact of this proposed zoning to the greater community and with no major concerns being found, staff recommends you approve this request for a rezoning from Canyon Trails Phase 1 PAD with an underlying C2 zoning to MF24 with Cascade Falls at Canyon Trails Planned Area Development Overlay, which includes multifamily uses, a density of 24 units per acre, modified development standards, and design enhancements subject to staff report and stipulations. And with that, I'll sit here for questions. Thank you. Is your applicant here and would you like to speak? I believe the applicant is here if they oh, are needed. We have Mr. Bull here tonight. Good evening, Mr. Bull. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, Ed Bull. I think for the first time ever, I'm gonna say our address is 1850 North Central. We never mm -hmm. moved this summer. I haven't been there much, but we moved this summer. <laughs> uh, I'm here on behalf of Daryl and Matt and Brad and others involved in this. We're perfectly comfortable with the staff and planning commission recommendations for approval. I agree with everything that Christian just said. If you want a presentation, I'll be happy to give it. Presuming you don't, I'll be happy to sit down. Thank you. I think that we're all right with what the presentation has been. So uh, don't go away. You might have asked a question or two. I could take my mask off, I guess, yeah. when I talk. Thank you for coming before us. You bet. Are, you're welcome. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Okay. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Then I'm going to close the public hearing. And will the city clerk please read resolution 2020-2110 by title only, please? Adopt resolution number 2020-2110 declaring as public records those certain documents filed with the city clerk titled legal description and supplementary zoning map number 20-01 in Cascade Falls at Canyon Trails MF-24 with pad overlay development regulations, September 2020. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve resolution number 2020-2110? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion. Okay. You, so the motion from, thank you, from Councilman Campbell and a second from Councilman Hampton. Open for council the discussion. Vice Mayor Stipp. We did, yes. We did not receive any formal emails concerning this case. There was speakers at Planning and Zoning Commission, but I believe the applicant has um, spoken with those speakers. But we did the um, alternate proposal where we had to send out multiple postcards due to COVID. The gist of the concerns were a concern or a perception that multifamily might bring in um, safety concerns. And they had a school near the site. Sorry. Thank you. I thought it was me again, so I, I'm relieved. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Between the two of us, for crying out loud, um, we're going to go down together, I guess. Yeah, we are. Um, I'm not concerned about this particular project. Um, as what I was saying is we've got a lot of these commercial, little commercial corners. Um, some are well-suited for a project like this. Others are too small or not in the right place, too close to residential. Um, but this particular one is... Uh, is a good project given what we've got just in the general area um, going forward, so I have no objection. Councilman Loretano. I, I agree with Council Member Stipp. I think this is a good place for it. It looks like a very nice project, so um, I do support it. Just one question. I tried to see, make it bigger to, to pixelate. If there's a tot lot, we cover those, right? 
So this project has not formally gone through oh. the site plan process. We're just in zoning. Oh, okay. So, so as we're... we look at the site plan, we look to make sure there's a, a nice amenities. Available. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks like it, that's the plan. I think that's a great spot for it. Close to freeway access, a good place to put it. So I support it. Thank you. Councilman Hampton. Yeah. I, I also support this particular location as well. And I was curious to see there's two entrances, right? So we have an egress only coming off of Cerebral itself. So that is just conceptual. That drawing was, they have not submitted a formal site plan. That drawing is more to show uh, setbacks okay. in relation to the single family, multifamily, to make sure that it's going to be a good neighbor to the adjacent properties. As we get through the site plan process, we'll work with our friends in engineering to make sure that those ingresses and egresses meet all the design, the standards. Okay. Yeah. I know, because I don't think they can even get a light. I wouldn't know if I'd want a light that close. So, Okay. I'm just curious about that the ingress egress. I see some notes here, so, so I was clarifying. But but yeah, other than that, yeah, I think it's a good neighbor to the other multifamily and to the neighborhood. I like the set the setbacks as well. So I think it'll be a good project for that location. Thank you. Councilman Campo. Well, I appreciate you mentioning the colors, that they're going to use more than one color or two colors, and we're not gonna discuss the colors tonight, but I'll be anxious to see what they bring back to us so that we can see what it actually will look like. But just conceptually, it looks like a pretty neat project for us. Councilmember Kano. I appreciate the landscaping buffer, although not required on the northern border. It's a nice touch and I appreciate that extra effort to, to do that. I'm last, I do approve of this. Um, I know that corner would be difficult to have commercial on. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they're prepared for church row um, because I'm sure the church members will be knocking at the doors there. Um, it's a great street, and I, I think the uh, combination of what is located on that street, I think the fear should go away from people. So I, I, I don't see anything uh, that that's going to cause that. But I am curious, so where are the trash? Where was the trash on there? Can you just show that to me? So in the zoning where it's stipulated is that it needs to be more than 150 feet away from the nearest residential lot. Okay. So effectively what that does is it puts it in this northwest corner. So it's adjacent to other carports and the multifamily side and an open space tract and a wall dividing it from the single family. So it's one area that they'd be going to. That is the most likely area that it would okay, be. My only on concern it. of that is to make sure that they have someone that doesn't get it doesn't get overloaded, and doesn't you know attract in the summertime bugs and things like that. Okay, that 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 would be my main concern. But other, I, I think it's going to do quite well on that corner. It's nice to see something on that corner, <laughs> don't you think? Yeah. All right. Any other discussion? All right, council. May I have a, a, a roll call vote, please? Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right. Will the city clerk please read an ordinance 2020 1483 by title only, please? Adopt ordinance number 2020 1483, conditionally rezoning approximately 12. 0.2 acres of property located at the northwest corner of Cerebral Avenue and Van Buren Street to be known as Cascade Falls at Canyon Trails, amending the zoning map of the city of Goodyear, providing for non-abridgment, providing for corrections, providing for severability, providing for an effective date, and providing for penalties. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve ordinance number 2020-1483? Do I hear that motion? So moved. All right, I heard a motion from Councilman Kano and a second from Vice Mayor Stiff. Open for council discussion. I think we had it, didn't we? All right, roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. Well, good. Now we're on uh, number six. And our You're next. Welcome. You're welcome. Thanks. Ed. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Bye. <clears throat> All right, the next public hearing item is to consider approving the platinum storage special use permit request for the convenient storage mini storage on property zone C2 General. Open the public hearing. Planner Christian William presenting again. Still here, here with a request from Taylor Earl to uh, hear a special use permit request on a property within the city. The property is approximately 3.05 acres 
and it is located on the southeast corner of Litchfield Road and Van Buren Street. Property is currently zoned C2 General Commercial, and the property is in the location of this star here on the map. So right here in central Goodyear, east side of our city. Zooming in a little closer, you can see that the project is within an existing shopping center called the Goodyear Commercial Park. And the property is east of the Goodyear Financial Center, which is where our current city hall is, mm -hmm. west of the historic Goodyear neighborhood of Litchfield Manor, and north of an existing professional plaza. The property is also within an existing commercial center, which includes the Vineyard Church, Taco Bell, and the Southwest Valley Chamber of Commerce. The applicant intends to redevelop an existing building to include the development of a self-storage facility and has submitted the subject application for the special use permit. The subject property is, again, 3.05 acres, and the site contains an existing commercial building and sections of an existing parking lot. Improvements will be made to both on and off the parcel in order to add parking landscape islands, improve parking lot circulation, and enhance the landscapes, sca landscaping both on and off their parcel within the Goodyear Commercial Park. The proposed 105,000 square foot retail building will convert the existing 34,000 square foot building from a vacant retail store, which was originally an Abco grocery store, but in its most recent life was a Goodwill. Mm -hmm. And it will convert that into an indoor convenience storage mini storage facility. The existing single story building was built around approximately 1976 mm -hmm. and has a roof height of about 23 feet, three inches. Once the building is redeveloped, it will be a three-story building with a roof height of approximately 30 to 32.6 feet. The building, however, attempts to give off an exterior appearance of being a two-story building in height. The proposed business operation hours for the general public will be Monday through Sunday between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. And the site improvements will include the demolition and reconstruction of the interior of the building, repainting the building, reconfiguring the parking lot, adding additional parking lot landscape islands both on and off the parcel and refurbishing and repainting the existing landscaping um, behind the center along Lamara Boulevard and Las Palmas Book Drive. As you might recall, those areas are kind of blank right now. The preliminary site plan shows once the redevelopment work is completed, there will be 115 spaces within uh, will remain on their particular parcel, which is that um, parcel shape and teal. It kind of zigzags through the site. So there'll be 115 spaces on that section. Um, that is a reduction of from their 140 by about 25 spaces. But the former retail building only required 114 spaces. The storage facility actually only needs 18 spaces. So in addition, the entire parking lot within the Goodyear Commercial Park will be reconfigured to have a total of 221 shared parking spaces. Based on the future square footage is within that the center after this building is done, the center will only need 216 spaces. The net result is a loss of parking, but enhancements in the aesthetics of the center's parking lot, a future surplus of four parking spaces, and an added bicycle parking area. I will also point out that the storage unit is completely indoor and climate controlled, and the main vehicle entrance will be conducted on a somewhat of a garage door looking feature that is on the front of the building. So a car will drive up to the center, enter the center, close the door behind them, and then their storage will take place primarily through that main entrance on the front. Conceptual building elevations included with the special use permit application convey the architectural design intended for the building. Again, the proposed building is about 30 feet in height, not counting the screen walls, and that is under the 56 feet that is a maximum established in the C2 zoning district. With that, staff has evaluated the impacts of the special use permit to the greater community. With no major concerns being found, staff recommends your approval of the special use permit for a convenient storage, mini storage, on a 3.05 acre property zoned C2 General Commercial, located southeast of Litchfield Road and Van Buren Street, subject to the stipulations found in the staff report. Thank you. Is your representative there here? You they are. Like and they, oh, if I they think would I like see to. They may. Yeah. Yes. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. For your record, I'm Taylor Earl with Earl and Curley. Address is 3101 North Central Avenue. 
Um, here to happy to answer any questions. I think like my predecessor, I will take great wisdom from Mr. Bull any day. I have a presentation as well, but happy to also not give it, uh, kind of depending on questions. So, so anyway, just at least let me say that I'm grateful for Christian for his work on this and, and helping us through the process. Well, thank you very much for appearing. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I have a motion a second to approve the request for the special use permit for convenient storage, mini storage, on 3.5 acre property zone C2, which is general commercial, located the southeast of Litchfield Road and Van Buren Street, subject to stipulations. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Stipp and a second from Councilman Laura Tonnell. Open for co uh, council discussion. Councilman Campbell? Well, up until the time we had COVID, I spent a lot of time in that parking lot because of Southwest Valley Chamber. And just knowing that someone wants to come in and try to revitalize that section is so exciting. But more exciting is that they're going to redo the parking lot, which is a mess. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. No, I, I but it think is it, a mess. I don't I mind think you're coming. right. It needs repair and cleanup. It does desperately, and then the church can use it when they are in having their services. And um, this is an excellent use of that building because there's no um, retail that's going to come in there. And I think this will really enhance and look really lovely, and maybe even spruce up that whole area there. So I, I'm very happy that they're bringing this forward, and and I appreciate them finding a vacant building and wanting to redo it. Of course, your comment is, uh, is apropos, 1976, we'd, oh, all, we'd yeah. all need cleaning up. Yeah. So <laughs> it just <laughs> happened. Uh, <laughs> Vice Mayor? Ironically, my brother was the store manager at that ABCO <laughs> at one point in time. Sorry. Um, oh, what a legacy. Back in, <laughs> way back, yeah, no one knows what ABCO is, but... Um, Anyway, uh, have we addressed the building height? Is that in the approach to the airport? It, I do not recall if it's exactly in the approach, but the airport would have been notified had it been. Had and it been, we okay. did not receive any comments concerning that. I think geographically it may be much farther away than, than necessary, and we always have to be concerned about building heights when we talk about approaches to the airport. Um, I agree with Councilmember Campbell 100%. Um, this is going to do nothing but improve that area. Um, it will have been yet another transformation of that site. I think it's too small. It's too small to be a big uh, retail spot, and it's too big to be a small commercial spot. It's just, uh, it's just not the right size anymore. So this is a unique opportunity for us to do something different with an existing piece of property. So, uh, Taylor, I think this is a good one, too. Tom's okay, no? I agree. It's a fresh, modern look for this this location. I was curious: uh, is the building going to be redeveloped or torn down and redone? From what they're proposing, it's basically like the interior is going to be gutted of it, and then it'll be raised. So it might be that it goes down to the flat and then raised up, but it's going to be in the exact footprint that it is today with those enhancements. That okay, you see so you. that the other business adjacent to it will still be able to operate and, and wouldn't be impeded at all. And what about uh, often? I think he. Oh, sorry. Please. I can answer that. Yes. We're, we're utilizing the existing building. It will okay. not be raised. Okay. Thank you. So it'll be lifted, raised in that sense. It'll okay, not be but not raised level. <laughs> okay. It's all in the spelling. And then the other question I had was oftentimes uh, storage offers. Could you uh, uh, move that? I'm sorry. Phone. Oftentimes storage offers trailers and truck rentals. Is that a part of the business model? That here? is not. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Laura Tano. I, I think this is a, a good use of that property as well. I'm very impressed that they're going to redo the whole parking lot, you know, per se, because storage does not have a lot of people coming and going. Usually you take your stuff and you leave it. So um, like the fact it's interior, it's a good look and it really will enhance that whole corner, especially the parking and the other businesses are going to get such a benefit out of this with the parking changes and updates. So thank you. Councilmember Hampton. Yeah, so I have a few questions as well. So so is there so the door is only in the front, correct? Mm -hmm. So is there any doors in the you drive in the back at all? There is an existing door that I believe will be in the back, but that's going to be only if the front door is is full. And there is a wall still between the 
door in the back and where the street is. And there'll be more landscaping that's added as well. Okay, but the back won't be the main entrance. Front will be the main entrance, the one you see here in the front, and the back would be like a secondary. Okay, so if I'm using that place, I'd, I would see that I don't, the door would open, I'd go in, unload, and then come out the same direction. Absolutely. Okay, and then I saw, it looks like there's a, maybe I'm looking at the wrong things here. The hours of operation, I saw it was from 6 to 10, but then I look at, at your, your, part, your piece of paper, and then it talks about, nine to six so that's that's a great catch so what we've done is we've stipulated it to allow them to have some flexibility but make sure they're not going to keep going and going and extending so we have put a stipulation on this use report they don't need to go to those hours which they don't plan to utilize all those hours but from a stipulation standpoint we put a hard end and start on those hours okay so it's the six to ten six to ten is the hard start hard. and stop max it'll, it'll most likely time. be yes tighter Okay. Okay. That's what I was curious. And then the bike, the bike rack, I know it's the whole parking lot. So is the bike, do you know where the bike racks are going to be? I doubt, I doubt, that is for the storage area. Correct. So, so on the site plan, it's actually, it's more or less on the sidewalk portion, like the plaza portion of the site currently shown. Um, I can't read it from here, but it's approximately here. They're going to have some bike parking. Okay. Yeah. And I'm also, yeah, I want to make sure the businesses don't get interfered. I know it's like a barber shop, like, right in the corner next to them so i know they had some issues before with marketing and trying to get people to know they're even there so i don't want them to get blocked out by whatever how it gets built or how the facade is created so so that that'd be just one of my concerns yep. just to make sure we don't don't hinder any other small businesses that are in there as well but but yeah but i think this will be a good i like how it's set up i like that it i mean It'll help the plaza have a little bit more traffic as well, and they're redoing the plaza. So I think there's a lot of positives to it, and and having it in the front. And I, I think I think it's unique. I think it's a good it's a good use for that part of the community. So so yeah. So thank you. Well, council's discussion is done. I I think it is too. I think we needed something to make that come alive, and we certainly have had many different businesses in there. Mm -hmm. So we have proven it's time to do something like this. And, uh, because this is more of a need, truly a need. And so I think it's going to be very successful, and it's really going to look nice. I mean, it's really going to make that plaza look so much better. So I'm pleased to see that. So we're all done talking. Let's vote on it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're down to business. I'm going to give him a chance to move. <laughs> All right, Council, I'd like to remind you to wait for the motion a second for the discussion. The first item in business is consider approving the comprehensive sign package for the Goodyear Recreation Campus. Planner, Principal Planner, Steve Garashi will present. I, and I also see your applicant is here, so if he wants to come, just, okay. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. I do have a comprehensive sign package for you tonight. And this is the property. I know everybody is well familiar with it, the Goodyear Recreation Campus. We're looking at the first phase here tonight. And surrounding it, we have the basis charter school here, Desert Edge. We have wildflower kind of wrapping around the west and to the north. We have future Hudson Commons residential to the north. Then across Australia Parkway, we have existing residential and commercial development within Sentara. So the overall property, about 80 acres, its own PFD, Public Facilities District, and that was back in uh, August. Uh, site plan was approved uh, September 2019. And so tonight what we're looking at is this first phase that includes the rec center, the aquatics facility, the park, and it's about halfway complete to the summer 2021 opening. So tonight action, the comprehensive sign package that is for a comprehensive and coordinated signage with enhanced design. Uh, in return for that coordinated signage and enhanced design, the CSP process does allow for modifications such as larger signage or more signage. 
However, if you do request larger or more signs with the CSP, then that does require review and approval through the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council. So for the sign package for this first phase, we looked at building signs, monument signs, and wayfinding signs. And these exhibits were taken from the sign package for the campus. And in looking at the ground signs first, the primary monument sign will be located right here at the corner, Australia uh, and Harrison. Then we'll have three smaller monument signs here at the entrances along Goodyear Boulevard and Sherman. And then throughout the site, then we'll have several wayfinding signs, given it is a large 40 acre sized property. Then for the building signs, we'll have one sign. Uh, this is uh, the Rec Campus building. We'll have one sign facing internal into the park. And then the other sign will be focusing to that intersection. That'll be the larger building ID sign. And with this comprehensive sign package, there were several modifications requested. I'll go over each one here. Uh, the first one was to the building sign. That was the sign facing the intersection. Uh, per the code, they could have 137 square feet of signage. What they're requesting is 198 square feet. Uh, for the sign, the wall sign facing internal into the park, they'd be allowed 75 square feet. They're asking for 94. For that primary monument sign there at the intersection, the ground sign, uh, 32 square feet would be what would be allowed by the zoning code. Uh, this package is requesting 42. And then the wayfinding signs throughout the park, those are not a sign type envisioned by the sign code, so those would be a new sign type requested through this sign package. As outlined in the code, there are criteria that we do look at in terms of any modifications being requested and if they are warranted. And just looking at those real quick, it's do the size and location offer sufficient visibility and legibility, or is it an enhanced design? Is it compatible with the surrounding area? And then as we looked at those evaluation criteria, the staff report goes through it in more detail, but just in looking at it, what staff looked at was a large multi-use development that was more akin to a non-residential, more akin to a commercial type development, given all the uses and activities that were gonna occur on this property. We also looked at the signage is pushed a little further back on the site due to the RID canal that runs along Australia. So it was about 45 or 50 feet the signage had to be pushed in to the site. Then they wanted the signage visible. The main focal point is from Australia Parkway. That's a large street, uh, speeds, arterial speeds. So they wanted to have the signage viewable from traffic along Australia Parkway. And then they did design it, a coordinated theme, does match the theme picked for the campus as well as uh, city standards that we use. And then for compatibility with the surrounding area, the one thing we looked at, we wanted to make sure that if any signs were illuminated, would, they, uh, would we have light trespass into any residential areas? The nearest residential will be about 600 feet away in Centera across the Estrella Parkway. So we looked at the illuminated sign on that building face. However, given the 600 feet of distance and then it would sign would only be illuminated during business hours, we do not feel that light trespass would be an issue with that illuminated sign. So in looking at the findings and the evaluation criteria, we did find that it met the criteria. We did find the modifications were acceptable for this campus. And then wanted to note that any future phases or any future signs or changes, they would require an amendment to this CSP. So it would have to come back before the planning commission and council. And just wanted to note as for example, uh, the commission and council may see a future amendment for a digital sign for that sign, that monument sign along Australia Parkway, that would be a change that would be required to come back before the Planning Commission and then before the City Council. Uh, but with that, Mayor, that concludes my presentation. Uh, staff's available for any questions. Thank you. So would you like Senior Project Manager Anthony Humphrey to speak? Is he here? Did he want to, did any, any comments? Okay, thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Then can I have a motion and second to approve the comprehensive sign package for the Goodyear Recreation Campus subject to stipulation. Do I hear a motion? 
So moved. moved. Second. All right, I heard a motion by Councilman Campbell and a second by Councilman Hampton. Um, open for council discussion. Councilman Lortano. I, I think it's a very nice package. I, I'm glad you went bigger because that's the one thing we don't want people speeding along. Oops, I missed it, you know, and, and we want to be able to see them and so our residents can go there. So I think that's very good. Um, so we're not going to have a digital to start out with or is that going to come later? Like a message? Oh, hi, Nathan. Because <laughs> I support that. I just didn't know if it's in the plans for later or what you guys are thinking. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Member Loretano. Um, so to answer that question is we are preparing a future amendment uh, for an additional digital marquee sign. Um, our planning team felt that uh, we've been at this uh, current uh, comprehensive design package for several months and uh, amending it now we felt could potentially slow down the project and we want to make sure that our signs were in place for opening day which is actually just a short uh, six months away um, and so um, having said that, we are working on an amendment now for an additional digital marquee sign. We anticipate that that will take several months uh, to go through the process before it uh, will come before you for consideration. Um, and then once upon receiving that uh, approval, we will then construct. Um, I am not sure if that amendment will be in place uh, for opening day, that additional digital marquee sign, um, but we will do our uh, due diligence to try and meet that deadline, but uh, it may not be possible. Oh, well, but it is okay. forthcoming. But it's coming. Okay. It is forthcoming and, and, and it's funded. And uh, so. Oh, no. It looks great. So thank you. Councilman Pasillo. Just to follow, follow up on that. Uh, on the digital sign that you're looking at, it's going to be in a, a new one. Not You're not converting something that's already there, correct? That is correct. So. I guess I'm hoping that the, in the plans while you're doing that, you're going to have the wiring and everything else, at least where you think it's going to be or where it's going to be, so that once you do the amendment, you're not coming back in and, and doing some type of changes to the construction or whatever the case may be so that it works. So you're kind of already planning where you think this thing's going to be and electricity and all the wiring that's going to be needed to work this thing. We, that's a great question. Um, and, yes, we are making all those provisions now and planning for okay. that. Um, and we have our first due diligence meeting uh, this week with, with planning and zoning. Okay. Vice Mayor Sip. I'm going to have ask this question of the attorney. Is there anything we can do tonight that will allow, is there an amendment we can make that skips this whole other process? I was just thinking about that. I think with such a fundamental difference between a static sign and a, an electronic sign, I, I'm not sure that we're uh, meeting the notice provisions uh, of the open meeting law. So i probably recommend against it. I, I, I know it doesn't seem like a huge change, but going from just a regular sign to a digital sign without giving you know, appropriate public notice could be problematic. So I would, I would recommend against that. Okay. Um, second question I had was um, now talking about the the size of this. Steve, are there others that are proportionately this much larger in the throughout the city? You know, we've got these sign pieces, yeah. and I think you went to you know if, if it's thirty two square feet, and now but we're for this location we're approving forty two square feet. Yeah. Have we done that elsewhere in the community? Adelaide. Mayor, Council, yes, we do have several, most of our large developments do have a signed package and like the process does allow in return for an enhanced design, we do allow larger signs. Most of our monument signs are in the realm of 12 to 20 feet high, anywhere from 75 to 100 square feet of copy area. And those are similar in area to our rec campus. So what we looked at the rec campus as a multi-use um, large area in versus a single use, which is what the zoning code treated this as, a single use and so a single use zoning. So we looked at as much larger type of development that warranted larger signage, which the recommendations that came through for this one 
modifications were very similar, like the wall signage that they're requesting seemed much larger, the 190 something versus the 137. We typically allow most of our larger commercial centers of similar size, about one and a half square feet of copy area. This comes in about 1.4, so it's basically a little less, but similar to what we have allowed uh, for other centers, other non-residential uses throughout the city. So it is very similar to other requests that we have. And I think that's an important distinction. So, you know, anyone who's listening understands that we aren't granting ourselves special privilege because it's our building, that we're following the similar things that we hold everybody accountable to. We're holding ourselves accountable to the same um, to the same piece. So um, I appreciate the work. I think the whole package is going to, the whole area is going to look great. Um, it, so I've got no, no, certainly no objection. Councilman Kano. I just have a question for clarification. It's about the wayfinding signs. It, there was mentioned that it was a unique design for the primary and secondary. It's that eight foot tall sign with, that goes straight up and down is, is that one? It's, it wasn't labeled, and I just want to make sure I understood it. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. I have a Sorry, question. Jenna. Yeah, thank you. Well, first, I'm going to say that I'm extremely disappointed that the digital sign package is not coming through now to get it done because once we go through planning and zoning, it's months and months and weeks and weeks. And I know we had this conversation when we were talking about the rec center, we said, be sure you have the digital signage because we've got it at the community park. So we're not doing anything that we don't already do. But that said, I'm in support of all of this, but I just wish we would have been able to have it all once for us so that when we open, we have it all ready to go. That's all I can say. I don't know how we missed it, why it wasn't inc included in it. I, we've all talked about it, and we were all in favor of it. Although I do know that planning and zoning was not necessarily in favor of the moving sign because they had the conversation with the Culver sign, and we understand that. But we knew what we thought was going to be good for our rec center. So let's just, if possible, let's get this process going as quickly as possible so that it's not six or eight months down the road. Because once we get open, those digital signs are gonna be wonderful because they're gonna tell people what the classes are, what's going on, and it's just gonna add to the excitement of this beautiful rec campus. So thank you very much. Councilmember Kano? No? Anybody else? Well, um, aren't those neighborhoods lucky? Boy, Look at are. all the neighborhoods that have been there for so long mm -hmm. without any recreational facilities but the school. Um, and I'm sure they're all just jumping with joy, thinking that's certainly going to raise their property value and, and be next door. I mean, I think it's terrific. And I really love the signs. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. I like the idea you're keeping that the same signs that were designed a long time, the same colors. I think people now are identifying go deer with those colors. So I greatly appreciate that. And I think they're very creative. The Goodyear Recreation Campus sign is just pretty outstanding. So and I like the tall one too. So thank you so much for doing that. Okay, I think all the discussion is finished. <coughs> this is an exciting time. This is our campus. I'm looking so forward. So all in favor of say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you very much. I just like to give you time to get up the table so you're not rushing, okay? <coughs> All right, the next item on business is to consider approving the intergovernmental agreement with the state of Arizona for the installation of intelligent transportation system equipment along McDowell Road from SR 303 to one quarter mile west of Dysert and approve the related budget transfer. Now, the, as we go through here, you might have to remind me, but there's only one presentation for the next eight to 10 item. Okay. So uh, city traffic engineer, Hugh 
Big Golf, Big Golf will present. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and as you reminded everybody, yes, this presentation will cover items eight, nine, and 10. Okay, so to lead off, the presentation this evening will be for the Intelligent Transportation Systems Projects, and there will be uh, three projects I'll be discussing, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have at the end of the presentation. Just a quick, uh, quick rundown of what we'll be discussing. First will be the project details, uh, following that project funding, and then closing with the staff recommendation. First project I'll be discussing is the TMC, otherwise known as this Traffic Management Center, in Estrella Pebble Creek Parkway from MC85 to Indian School Road. This, is, uh, this project covers both the TMC and Estrella Pebble Creek Parkway. And this project, or this particular project, will replace our outdated traffic signal controllers and video detection systems along the corridor, and will replace them with new controllers, detection systems, and vehicle travel time hardware at 18 intersections along this corridor. Also, with this project, the traffic signal controllers will have available smart city features not available with our current deployed technology. And secondly, getting to the TMC portion of the project will be traffic signal software, which will have the ability to provide reporting on corridor performance and also signal performance measures on a lane by lane basis. Most like, and just some of the examples of that are some of the details it can provide are the number of vehicles arriving on green, vehicles arriving on red, also display pedestrian report to us, pedestrian and preemption delay reporting travel time reporting, and high resolution traffic data and analytics. This is a fiscal year 2021 project. It'll be designed by city staff, built, uh, bid by ADOT, and installed by a contractor. The federal portion of the project funding wise is $1,553,900, which is paid via CMAC funding, which is otherwise known as congestion mitigation and air quality funding and $130,000 is the local portion, which the breakdown of that is $113,700 from traffic signal asset management and $16,300 from surplus HERF maintenance funds. The second project is Litchfield Road from MC85 to Wigwam Boulevard. As with the prior project, it also replaces outdated traffic signal controllers and video detection systems, replaces them with new controllers, video detection systems, and vehicle travel time hardware at 14 intersections along this corridor. This project is a procurement only project, meaning that it'll be designed by city staff, the materials will be purchased and installed by city staff, and the material costs will be reimbursed by ADOT. The federal cost of this project is $487,600 paid for via special census funds and $65,500 in local funds. A further breakdown of that is $61,800 from traffic signal asset management and $9,700 from surplus HERF maintenance funds. And now the third project, which is McDowell Road, from SR-303 to a quarter mile west of Dysart Road, otherwise known as Palm Valley Cornerstone. This project will, as the prior projects, replaces outdated traffic signal controllers and video detection systems with new equipment, as in new traffic signal controllers, video detection systems, and vehicle travel time hardware at 11 intersections. And this project is also in fiscal year 21, it is a procurement only project, which as the same as Litchfield Road, it's designed by city staff, the material will be purchased and installed by city staff, and then the material costs will be reimbursed by ADOT. Uh, what you have in the slide above you is the overall project costs for these three projects. And just reading along the bottom for the overall costs are the federal, total federal cost for these three projects is $2,339,000. Uh, 
the local share or the city share of these projects is $363,100 for an overall project cost for all three projects of $2,702,100. And with that, the staff recommendation is request council adopt resolutions 2020-2089, 2020-2090, and 2020-2091, approving three intergovernmental agreements and related budget transfers. Thank and you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. I don't think there were anybody left in the audience to speak, but if there is... All right, will the city clerk please read resolution number 2020-2089 by title only, please? Adopt resolution number 2020-2089, approving an intergovernmental agreement with Arizona Department of Transportation for the purchase and installation of intelligent transportation system equipment along McDowell Road from SR 303 to one quarter mile west of Dysart Road, providing authorization, direction, and an effective date. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve resolution number 2020-2089? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. second. I heard a motion from Councilman Campbell and a second from uh, Councilman Pazillo. Open for council discussion? No. Did she second it? I, I first. She first did. First. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so Councilman <laughs> Laura Tonnell did the motion. And then who did this? I, I said you were right. I said you were right. Okay, sorry. Okay, open for council discussion. No. So did the city clerk get that, the correct one? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councilman Loretano. I, I just, now I not forgot what I was going to say after all. <laughs> um, okay, That's because so, you got so involved with who, who did the motion. Um, yeah, who's on first? So <laughs> when we're talking about um, smart, will this... I guess the, the, the way that the public sees it is time the traffic lights. So like on Australia, you're not stopping at every single light. Is this going to help that problem? It will help us in, yes, it should help us in that. Um, when you speak of smart cities, um, one of the, just one of the features of the smart city component of traffic signal controllers is being able to report the timing to connected vehicles. That's uh, one of the important pieces or one of the, important pieces I read up on regarding smart city technology and the traffic signal controller. Um, as uh, I have to understand that our existing traffic signal controllers and view detection systems are approximately 2004 technology. So if you consider the technology of a computer in 2004 to today, a substantial, substantial change. And that's one thing with uh, our traffic signal technology is very similar. Some of it doesn't have the the more advanced features that are commonly found in traffic signal technology. So it does help us in alleviating or getting uh, corridors coordinated maybe more easily. I'm not saying it's a, uh, you know, it's a cure all, this will, this will cure all the traffic issues in Goodyear, but it will definitely help. Okay, yeah, because on Australia, like you, and I know some of those roads, you'll stop, you'll stop, you'll stop. And I know it's not perfect, but this will help alleviate that and keep the traffic flowing. Yes. And then my other question is, I'm really glad you're doing this, the, the grant money you've got. I think that's great. Um, it said from, on Australia, from MC85, will that be on that light on MC85? Because that's a really bad intersection. Or is that not ours? Or can we? That is ours, yes. Australian MC85 is our traffic signal, even though MC85 belongs to the county. That is our traffic signal, yes. Okay, so the smart technology will be on that one as well. Yes. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Councilman Hampton? No, I... I do. I think it's a grant is a is a is a great grant to be able to grab or to to, to research or to get for us. I think it'll really help. It'll be a lot of bang for our our buck with uh, putting a uh, small local amount for the couple million dollar return in the federal grant. And I I just had a question. So the hardware that we're replacing is it the the camera or the on top and then also electronics in the boxes. I'm just curious what. A resident would see that's different would they see anything differently i guess yes great question the uh what will be replaced is yes in that picture the camera you see above the what we call the mast arm the horizontal piece uh that camera will be replaced and there's typically on a regular intersection there's four of those so those will get replaced and then the uh the hardware in the cabinet is uh there's two different pieces one is the portion that controls the detection controls the camera 
and the other portion is the traffic signal controller, which is, I would call it the size of a, maybe a microwave oven from 10 years ago. I mean, it's about that size. It's nothing, nothing oversized. It's uh, everything is generally standard as it's essentially you disconnect uh, some uh, connectors on the controller, uh, plug it in and set your settings and it's uh, set up and running. So generally it, it's pretty simple. Everything is very yeah. standardized. No, that's nice. I was just curious if there's any, any tearing about the street. It's like there shouldn't be any construction on the street itself. So it should be fairly, a fair, not simple, but a fairly, people shouldn't really notice too much. It should be pretty, fairly quick to, to install. So or at, yes. least at least less, less impact on the residents. So. Yeah, everything that will be replaced is either on the traffic signal structure or in the cabinet. There's nothing yeah. in the road that gets replaced. Okay. No, great. Thank you. Councilor Bazzillo. You know, I find this technology interesting. I, I travel from Goodyear to 35th and I guess Indian School in that area every uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I find the reason why I take the earlier class because if I if I leave at uh, eh, quarter after six in the morning, I at times can hit every light green between here and on Indian School mm -hmm. because of the traffic. But I'm between 40 and 45 miles an hour, not hit a red light. Okay. Uh, but if I leave later and the traffic slows down, I got a good chance of hitting a lot of those lights. So I guess what my question is, is for that smart software, will it be able to tell as traffic slows down to extend the lighting process or the, the timing between lights so that, you know, you're still trying to stay green for a long period of time instead of hitting every light red as a result? Because that's what's happening when I, when I go to Indian school. Uh, if I don't leave at the right time and the traffic is slowing down, I will hit pretty much every light. Is that what this is intended to do? Yes, this system will, on the traffic management center portion and the equipment that's being installed, will report back on the performance of the corridor, corridor something we can't do today. Right. As in, it'll give us, uh, at any time we select, it'll give us performance as to, and that's one of the big items, is arrivals on red, arrivals on green, as in the performance of a corridor. That's one way the system can evaluate how well it's performing. And also a portion of that is also the travel time hardware that will be able to, usually it's Bluetooth, and I believe that's te the technology we'll be looking at, that'll provide information on how well vehicles are traveling, maybe similar to uh, how uh, like uh, systems such as Google Maps can track. If you pull up the, uh, the traffic portion on the Google Maps app, you can see traffic or, you know, red, yellow, green, red, bad, yellow, you know, and green very well. That'll provide, uh, the travel time hardware will provide a similar function there. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Councilman Campbell? Well, it sounds like you're just going to put some new stuff inside, and it's not necessarily going to make us have green lights all the way down the board. So, Bill, we're not going to have green lights. They're not going to be able to time the lights, but it's going to tell somebody somewhere how many cars come to a light. So maybe if they read it and check it every hour, they'll know to extend it or something. I just am surprised we're not looking into how, unless we just absolutely cannot do it, why we're not trying to synchronize our lights. If you're going in to do this stuff, why aren't we doing whatever? I mean, I don't un even understand how to do it, and I'm sorry to say, but is there just absolutely no way we'll ever be able to synchronize the lights in the city of Goodyear ever? Councilmember Campbell, truthfully, great. Nope, truthfully. great question. It can be done. The problem is is when traffic volumes are balanced. That's one thing we deal with here, is when you want to favor a direction, it's very easy to do one direction. If you want to do both directions, it becomes more challenging, especially we've gone over this for years on Litchfield Road, where you have irregular spacing of traffic signals and where you want to balance, as in keep both directions green, it becomes very difficult. If you want to keep just one direction moving, it's much easier because then you can cascade across several signals or an entire corridor. When you're trying to balance each direction, it becomes very challenging. Um, but we try our best at doing that. The other thing we run into when it comes to coordination is, uh, for instance, Bullard Avenue that you brought up. That was uh, evaluated by MAG. I looked it up today. It was evaluated back in May of 2019. So the count, traffic counts were probably taken around March or April 2019. The plan was implemented in May of 2019. That's almost a year and a half ago. What we run into is, of course, traffic patterns change. Of course, we had COVID. 
developments come along. It's a, it's a never ending process where we have to become better at evaluating and updating our coordination plans. That's part of it. And that's where this system will help that on the reporting and actually be able to suggest better plans or how well a corridor is performing that would help us with the tools of trying to make a corridor better right now. It's basically whenever we think of it or in traffic's bad, then we have to manually go and readjust uh, the corridor mostly by using traffic counts and, and tools like that in software and then manually inputting the changes in the controller. Where a system like this, a lot of that function as in obtaining traffic counts then evaluating in the software, which traffic counts we have to get from an outside agency, that can take upwards of two to four weeks. Where now with the system, it'll gather those counts and it'll give us another tool to be more responsive quicker in evaluating those corridor concerns. And at least also we'd be able to report back to you on how well that corridor is performing, like a before and after study where we uh, make, before we make a change, we can show a report of the st statistics of how well that corridor is operating. And after we implement the changes, then provide report as to how well it's performing after the changes. Because what we run into again with MAG was when they, and they do a great job when they uh, give us a coordination plan and implement it. But the issue is they implement it and it's just how that program works. We understand their funding constraints. But what they do is they create a plan, we deploy it and they drive it usually one or two times. And after that, they're done. And after that, it's on us to stay on top of that. And uh, sometimes that becomes difficult with traffic changes and whatever else. Councilman Kano. Well, it sounds like it's a tool that will help us to make good decisions. I was just curious if this new system will allow any type of interface with public safety in terms of them accessing information from intersections and such. Um, great question. Uh, when it comes to information, one of the items I know that's come up recently is the uh, closed circuit television feeds, and that's something independent of this, but it's still on the same system. Um, I, I guess I don't know if there is uh, anything useful to PD or public safety from the aspect of this, but if there is, uh, it would definitely be able to evaluate it and see what's possible. Vice Mayor Stick. <laughs> I know you thought you were never going to. Oh, no, no, no. I was listening to. Either first or last is the best, so. Yeah, first. It, um, listening to the conversation and trying to just comprehend and maybe getting where we are. We had a, a really good conversation, I guess, on Friday at the retreat about this subject. The very basic question that I asked is, is there not software available that allows us to make this timing? I realize our lights are irregularly placed. If they were all one quarter of a mile apart, mathematically, it's probably very simple. Yes, sir. So because they're not, one's, you know, two thirds of a mile, one's a third of a mile. I mean, they're all, and then, you know, one's a half a mile. Is there not software that can manage getting those lights all synchronized together that allows us to achieve what you were trying to explain to Council Member Campbell about the, the, the direction? Uh, so let me just stop there. Is there not software that can do that? There is, and this software will definitely, definitely falls in that category as in not having to, because the current system current way of adjusting the uh, traffic signal coordination on a corridor is to one, gather traffic counts. So typically that's either gathered by somebody placing a camera as in outside agencies, we don't have the staff to do that, but uh, somebody placing a camera or somebody sitting out there in person and counting, usually approximately two hours in the morning, depending how many plans you have, usually two hours per uh, time of day. So two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and then somebody to then, uh, uh, break down that information and then input it into a software and then uh, then generate a plan. And then the next system, the next portion is then implementing that plan and then driving it as we don't have any way to report back how well the corridor is functioning. So essentially it's driving it and making adjustments as somebody drives that corridor. And all this takes time as in the, as I said earlier, 
gathering of traffic counts generally takes anywhere from two to four weeks to get that information. So the benefit of this software is it'll gather the counts internally. It'll do it via the uh, video detection system. It can gather the counts and it actually can recommend new timing plans that we would just simply have to implement, which would definitely cut down the time it would take. And also, again, as I said earlier, also provides us reports back on how well the corridor is functioning as in one of the big ones is arrivals on red, arrivals on green, meaning if you're driving along a quarter, say a straight parkway and you're pulling up to Van Buren headed north, that it would gather the data of how many vehicles arrived on red, how many on green to us. That is one of the metrics provided as a signal, what they call a signal performance measure as to how well a corridor is performing. On top of that, the other hardware that was mentioned earlier as in the vehicle travel time hardware is another tool we can use to see how well vehicles are progressing along that corridor. Again, it comes down to reporting how well that corridor is performing. Um, getting back to what you described as, uh, is it possible to, will it, summary is not be possible to coordinate. What we're finding in the uh, mag timing plans is they're dividing up the corridor on distances, as in maybe they're only going two miles at a time. Because what we run into a perfect example is that we have a, what they call currently have a TSOP or traffic signal optimization program with MAG going on right now. We deployed the timing on late Tuesday night and MAG's been evaluating it late last week. I haven't heard back what their initial findings were. But when they, they uh, developed that plan, so that plan went from Australia Parkway, actually along the same lines of one of the projects from MC85 to, uh, I believe went all the way to Indian School Road. What they did is based on volume, because the volumes differ greatly along Australia, how they broke it up is they broke it up into three different segments. One, MC85 to, I believe the furthest north signal was uh, Goodyear Boulevard North. That was one segment. They timed it at 90 seconds. The next segment, much higher volume, is in the one that's uh, problematic right now is Australia Parkway, Van Buren to McDowell. That was run as a 120 second segment. And then the third section was Pebble Creek Parkway from Coronado to Virginia. That was run as 90 seconds. So what we're seeing is uh, what comes back, it's it becoming very difficult to coordinate, again, a corridor such as uh, Australia and Pebble Creek or even Litchfield for that matter. It's becoming very hard to coordinate the entire run, but it seems to be what's coming back is and what things are trending to is maybe doing up to two miles at a time that I, it's harder to guarantee that. And as you know, by driving it, it's very hard to guarantee that I could get you or any uh, resident during the day, you know, five miles along a corridor without stopping. I, I'm not sure it can be done. Yeah. I, I don't, I think that would be a utopian approach to say I can get from MC 85 to Indian school and never touch a red light. I mean, I think that would be, you know, that'd be a fantasy. I, I think the the concern and the concerns that we hear um, is, you know, I can't get from um, from Falcon Drive to Litchfield on Indian School Road without hitting at least four red lights. I mean, that's the. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you look at these common travel corridors, you know, that little stretch of, of Indian school or, you know, the, 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 the stretch of McDowell from, um, from Litchfield to, to Dysart, you know, there's several traffic lights down that road. And, you know, on, on, on a bad day, you hit all of them. You know, so those little, those little components, and I think that's the frustration that we hear from residents. And the story that I told on Friday was um, – there was a uh, pretty bad accident at the corner of, or the intersection of Bullard and McDowell. Mm -hmm. And a group of people that I was talking to, somebody said, holy cow, there was this horrible accident. Um, any idea what caused it? And before I could answer, the, uh, another person in the group said, oh, it was somebody trying to not stop at another red light. I mean, that was the thing. And it was, and it, it's that sense of frustration that, that you hear from residents that, that really drive this. And um, we've been talking about fiber optic lines and all this stuff for, for years. And um, I'm only carrying this water faster and heavier than council member Campbell did a number of years ago. Um, but it, it's becoming more and more evident and, and <coughs> you weren't here, but a couple of weeks ago, we had a presentation 
about a new development project and they showed like three or four traffic lights within a, you know, what would it look like a quarter mile, but you know, I'm sure it was a half a mile. And it's like, Oh my God, if we put four traffic lights in this area, we can't get them to turn on and turn off at the same time. So I think that's the frustration. So um, if this is going to get us one step closer, um, then I think we're all going to be very happy with it. I, um, I certainly appreciate the old technology that are sitting in those boxes um, you answered the other question that I had was about the boxes themselves. We've gone through a lot of effort to get them painted or, or covered. I would hate to see all those get thrown out and put new ones in, but it sounds like you can just take the guts of the cabinet out and put new stuff in. So yeah, it's just a couple items in the cabinet. Yeah. So um, I think we'll, we'll, this will take us one step closer to utopia and at least in my mind, and we'll go from there. I really appreciate the work on it and the detailed explanation done a great job thank you thank you wally i forgot to ask how long is this going to take okay there's three different projects the first project the astrea and traffic management center project is anticipated to begin probably in december and right now we're thinking that project will probably hope to be completed by october and then the other two projects october of, of this fiscal of uh, this calendar year so october of 2020 okay and then the other two projects, they are procurement only. Those projects move much quicker, as in there's not a uh, there's not a construction aspect to it. So it, it's much quicker through the process. The intent is again that project would be or those two projects, Litchfield and then uh, McDowell. Those two separate projects, they're procurement only. Those projects are anticipated to begin design in December of this year, and hope to be completed by July of this year as they're procurement only. They move much quicker. I would be interested to find out or hear back from you when all of this is done and you get the reporting that you can tell us what you did and if it's really working. That would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Council, is everybody finished with your comments? Well, I have a couple of comments. So um, it's nice to see, first of all, we have some with some HERF money. Mm -hmm. So uh, that pleases me when I saw that amount up. Yeah. Um, and also with the federal. So because I'm one of these people have a tendency to criticize <laughs> in those both those cases. So uh, I'm eating some of this. They say I'm eating my apple pie over that one uh, because it proves that they do do something. And then last, Mr. Bringall, you are good and know your subject matter. Um, and it pleases me to no end because I have to have a conversation uh, up with another mayor and uh, you pointed out a couple of things. Increased population is one thing I think that hurts us. Uh, we are growing so fast, it's, I mean, that it's impossible to keep up at the rate that we're going, the rate that the home development is going. So you're always working against something. You know, you just get to the this and you, it's gonna work and then we get a surge of that. So I understand Bill's frustration and, and Molly's <coughs> and I have it off and on, um, but I can tell you, uh, sometimes I, it's a contest with me, I get every light coming to the city hall, all right, from, from Pebble Creek. And I, I, ex I get so excited I, because I, but you can do it once in a while. So when you say you can't do it, it just depends on that timing if you hit it and depending on how much traffic and the speed and all of that. So um, really good, thank you. Any other questions before we vote on this? Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stepp? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, the next item, nine. Um, this is to consider approving the IGA with the state of Arizona for the installation of the intelligent transportation system equipment along Litchfield Road from MC85 to Wigwam Boulevard and approve the related budget transfers. I'm assuming you have nothing more to say about that. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody like to speak? I'm laughing at that one. Okay, will the city clerk please read resolution ordinance number by title only, please. Adopt resolution number 2020-2090, approving an intergovernmental agreement with Arizona Department of Transportation for the purchase and installation of intelligent transportation system equipment along Litchfield Road from MC85 to Wigwam Boulevard, providing authorization, direction, and an effective date. Thank you. Can I have a motion, a second, to approve resolution number 2020-2090? Do I hear that motion? 
So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Councilman Hampton and a second by uh, Councilman Kano. Open for council discussion. I think you had a lot. All right, roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stepp? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member P -P Sorry. Pazillo? You got it. Aye. <laughs> See, Council See, Member Laura. do it once in a while. <laughs> Council Member Loritano. Aye. Council Member Campbell. Aye. Council Member Hampton. Aye. Mayor Lord. Aye. The motion carries. All right, on number 10, the next item on business is to consider approving the IGA with the state of Arizona for the installation of intelligence transportation system equipment at the Traffic Management Center and Australia Pebble Creek Parkway from MC85 to Indian School Road and approve the related budget transfers. Again, I don't think you have anything to add to this. Sorry, thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody like to speak? Will the city clerks then read resolution number 2020-2091 by title only, please? Adopt resolution number 2020-2091, approving an intergovernmental agreement with Arizona Department of Transportation for the upgrade of the traffic signal management software and networking equipment along Estrella Pebble Creek Parkway from NC85 to Indian School Road, providing authorization, direction, and an effective date. Thank you. Can I have a motion second to approve resolution 2020-2019? Do I hear that motion? So moved. I heard a motion from Councilman Campbell and a second from Vice Mayor Stipp. Open for council discussion. No discussion. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp. Aye. Council Member Pazillo. Aye. Council Member Loritano. Aye. Council Member Campbell. Aye. Council Member Hampton. Aye. Council Member Kano. Aye. Mayor Lord. Aye. The motion carries. So the last item, number 11 on business, is consider approving Amendment 1, Amendment 1 of the Intergovernmental Agreement with the Maricopa County for the installation of a traffic signal at the intersection of Camelback Road and Cerville Avenue. And... Again, city traffic engineer, Big Off will be presenting. Thank you, Mayor. Again, I'll be printing the inter Intergovernmental Agreement Amendment 1 for the traffic signal at Camelback Road and Cerebral Avenue. Okay, this is a Amendment 1 to the traffic signal at Cerebral Avenue and Camelback Road Agreement with Maricopa County. This IGA with Maricopa County is brought before Council on June 22, 2020 and was executed by both the city and Maricopa County. Shortly thereafter, in July of 2020, Maricopa County requested Amendment 1 to the IGA. On the slide above, uh, middle right, the blue dot indicates the location of the proposed traffic signal per this agreement at uh, the intersection of Camelback Road and Cerebral Avenue. The key amendment terms of this amendment are, one, the financial responsibility, which is an estimated cost of $754,900. This changed by the added cross-dock facility obligation of $150,000, and that was requested by McDot. Um, the construction cost changed with that addition from $554,900 to $704,900. And the changes to the overall project cost from the original agreement went from $604,900 to $754,900. However, I must reinforce the city obligation did not change with this amendment. This, these were simply funds the county added through a developer obligation. And the, also as part of this amendment, per request to the county, was construction be advanced of the traffic signal from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 2021, where the county advances the full project cost to the city in fiscal year 2021, and then the city then in turn reimburses Maricopa County in fiscal year 2022 for the county's share of the costs. And with that, I request council approve amendment one to the intergovernmental agreement with Maricopa County and related budget transfers. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Then I need, I, can I have a motion a second to approve the amendment one to the intergovernmental agreement with Maricopa County for the installation of a traffic signal at the intersection of Camelback Road and Cerebral Avenue and approve the related budget transfers. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Vice Mayor Stiff and a second by Councilman Bazillo. Any more conversation on this? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
we're at the end. So council, do you have any comments, accommodation reports, requests for future items tonight? None? Well, then I'm gonna turn this over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council. put her hand up? <laughs> Holly, did you put your hand up? I did, and I was just going to say, we've started the National League of Cities virtual conference. Yeah, I saw that. If we were in a good, normal world, we would be in Tampa, Florida right yeah. now. I might have gone it. to that one. Oh, it would have been <laughs> wonderful. But we've started, and it seems to be going very well. And today, I did chair the Military Communities Council, and... Uh, we had a much larger audience than we had anticipated, so it was very well received. Was there an issue? Uh, no, they just, I sent out invitations to 700 people, and I had 480 show up, oh. so it's I wonderful. And um, last Thursday, I was, um, I, I wasn't installed, but I received the gavel to be the president of the Women in Municipal Government for 2021 wow. for all of yeah, the United very States. Nice, so Wally. That's it. Thank you. Very nice. Any other thing before I turn it over to get, all right, city manager, you've got it. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. This is our last meeting before the Thanksgiving holidays. So I'd like to remind everyone that the Goodyear City offices will be closed on Thursday, November 26th and Friday, November 27th in observance of Thanksgiving. Emergency fire and police services will of course not operate, operate as normal. There will be no trash, recycling or bulk collections on Thanksgiving day. Those impacted should plan for collection the day after their regularly scheduled pickup. City offices will reopen at 8 a.m. on Monday, November 30th. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next meeting will be a regular meeting on December 7th. Oh my God, December already, huh? Oh, 2020 at 6 p.m., no further business. This meeting is adjourned.